A new study predicts record flooding in the coming decade, thanks to not just global warming, but also because of the moon. The study on high tide flooding predicts that the mid-2030s could be catastrophically wet in coastal regions around the world, and it could stay that way for an entire decade or longer. The study, which is led by members of the NASA Sea Level Change Team, says that high tide flooding could happen more frequently on several coasts worldwide, including in the States. Flooding at high tide, often called nuisance flooding, already occurs with regularity in many coastal communities as water routinely sloshes into streets, yards and businesses. The converging of the two factors, the rising sea levels fueled by climate change and the moon, could worsen the high tide flooding and even prove grossly dangerous and destructive. Is this something we are prepared for? And is there any way we can prevent it? Orbit Beyond the Blue So here's the thing. The Moon's orbit is due for its regular wobble. That is entirely natural, NASA says, and it has been recorded as far back as 1728. But NASA says global sea level rise due to global warming will likely push those high tides higher. And one of the study's co-authors, NASA Sea Level Change Team leader Ben Hamlington, said that because waters will be higher, this moon cycle could have a much more dramatic effect. Low-lying areas near sea level are increasingly at risk and suffering due to the increased flooding, and it will only get worse, said NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. The combination of the Moon's gravitational pull, rising sea levels, and climate change will continue to exacerbate coastal flooding on our coastlines and across the world. And there's no way to prevent it as such. The Moon and Earth exert a gravitational pull on each other. On Earth, the Moon's gravitational pull causes the oceans to bulge out on both the side closest to the Moon and the side farthest from the Moon. These bulges create high tides. The low points are where low tides occur. These prolonged coastal flood seasons will cause major disruptions to lives and livelihoods if communities don't start planning for them now the researchers cautioned. There's still a lot we do not know about our moon. For that, we will need to do more exploring. NASA plans to launch an uncrewed spacecraft as a part of the Artemisi mission. The last manned mission to the moon was Apollo 17, taking place between 7 and the 19th of December 1972. It was a 12-day mission and broke multiple records, such as the longest spacewalk, the longest lunar landing, and the largest lunar samples brought back to Earth. The brief history of our first stint on the Moon kick-started in 1962, with then-President John F. Kennedy's historic speech. The race to land humans on the Moon was announced by him in a public announcement at Rice Stadium in Houston, Texas. The speech is now known as the We Choose to Go to the Moon speech, in it. Kennedy mentioned his commitment to getting a human to walk on the moon by the end of the decade. And this will be done in the decade of the 60s. It may be done while some of you are still here at school at this college and university. It will be done during the terms of office of some of the people who sit here on this platform. But it will be done, and it will be done before the end of this decade. When the moon landing took place seven years later in 1969, Kennedy's goal had been achieved, and his deadline met. However, with the goal achieved, NASA faced large funding cuts and severe backlash, making the future of the Apollo missions untenable. There had originally been 20 Apollo missions planned, but technological and research-based missions were not seen as important as the achievement of the moon landing itself, and the final three missions were cancelled. The social and global impact of the Apollo 11 moon landing mission in July of 1969 was massive. What followed were six other trips to the massive rock. Only one of these missions failed, and a grand total of 12 men traversed the moon's surface. 
two years before the final man mission to the moon, Apollo 17, took place in December 1972. It was announced that all further trips to the moon had been cancelled. The biggest reason had to do with funding. There was no denying that it was ridiculously expensive. The total cost of the Apollo program, which ran from 1960 to 1973, caused the United States a whopping $25.8 billion. Adjusted for inflation, that number sits at a staggering $257 billion. Then there was the question of waning enthusiasm for the program. Often the object or topic of human fascination tends to shift. We tend to get over things pretty quickly. And constantly going to the moon didn't seem like the crazy challenge it was for the Apollo 11 mission once we had done it several times. But half a decade later, human beings will soon walk on the moon again, if all things go NASA's way. If everything goes as planned, a future mission could land astronauts on the moon in 2025. Several factors are now driving NASA to get astronauts back to the moon for the first time in more than 50 years. One is a long-running desire to get human beings on Mars. The Artemis missions will test some of the technology and logistics required to go about landing humans on the Red Planet. If the future of humanity is indeed spreading across the solar system, then logistically, the first stop has to be our own satellite, the Moon. The space race is one of the proudest moments in American history. But was it practical? Was there any reason for us to go to the Moon other than the fact that it was an astounding accomplishment? Probably not, but our species found a way to get off the planet we were put on and to land an expertly crafted vessel on the giant nighttime floating rock we had been staring at for some 300,000 years. Speaking of moons, let's talk about another moon that has attracted attention in recent years. Jupiter's moon Io. Some 40 odd years ago, NASA's iconic Voyager 1 probe sailed past Jupiter. And as it was flying by Jupiter's lodge moons, it found something amazing, yet terrifying. It found Io, the celestial object with the shortest name in the universe. It is also one of the most peculiar, and that's not because it resembles a pizza with anchovies. This tiny moon of Jupiter's is fierce, and you're about to learn why. Io's atmosphere is a volcanic world of freakish extremes. Not a day passes without Io throwing a temper tantrum. It is full of lava lakes, liquefied rocks and sulfuric ice. Io is a mystery even after all these years. Unpredictable, unstable, impulsive, and one of its greatest mysteries is its strange radio emissions. In recent times, NASA's Juno spacecraft got treated to a private show of Io's radio emissions. You can listen to it here. It's a fascinating discovery, because these radio signals are coming from a celestial satellite. This distinction encouraged researchers to learn more about what had triggered the strange radio waves. Many have even speculated whether Io is a magic energy machine. Basically, is Io a machine? Simple answer, not entirely true. It owes this capability to emit radio signals to its host planet Jupiter. Jupiter, among all the planets in our solar system, is known to have the largest and most powerful magnetic field. It extends so far that some of the planet's moons orbit within it. Io is the moon closest to the planet and is caught in a so-called gravitational tug of war between Jupiter and two other large moons, Europa and Ganymede. Subsequently, this leads to extreme heating and volcanic eruption. Io's surface is peppered with hundreds of volcanoes, some spewing sulfurous plumes hundreds of miles high. That is a product of the might of Jupiter. 
Imagine being a celestial body so small that your mere existence causes drastic geological activity on Closeby objects. Although Io is only about the size of Earth's moon, it still has a huge impact on Jupiter. As we saw earlier, Io being nearest to Jupiter cuts across Jupiter's powerful magnetic field. This literally transforms Io into an electric generator. Io has the capacity to develop 400,000 volts across itself and create 3 million amperes of electrical current. This then makes its way back along Jupiter's magnetic field lines and causes lightning storms in Jupiter's upper atmosphere. Io orbits within the fiercest field lines of Jupiter's magnetosphere, with an off-the-scale radiation environment. Io's surface radiation level is 3,600 rem per day, five times a lethal human dose. As Jupiter rotates, the magnetic forces trip away about a tur of Io's material every second. The material becomes ionized and forms a donut-shaped cloud of radiation called a plasma torus. Some of the ions are pulled into Jupiter's upper atmosphere and create auroras. Io's electrons caught in the magnetic field accelerate toward Jupiter's poles and, along the way, generate radio emissions. If located in the correct spot, Juno's Waves instrument can pick up these radio waves. The data that has been collected so far has been analyzed to understand the exact source of the radio emissions from within Jupiter's magnetic field. The conclusion of the research team was that the radio waves most likely came from a hollow conical space where the conditions were optimum perfect magnetic field strength and perfect density of electrons. Since the emission is akin to a lighthouse signal, the spacecraft picks it up only when the light falls on the spacecraft. And together, Jupiter and Io become a kind of a machine, essentially a pulsar, one that is the closest to us. Io's radio emissions picked up by NASA's Juno spacecraft will pave the path to us learning more about Jupiter, as well as its state as a gas giant. Orbit Beyond the Blue